Hello and welcome to GYC. Happy New Year. It's 2019. Thank you for joining us here at GYC as we're bringing you live coverage here from Houston, Texas, the George R. Brown Convention Center. It's hard to believe, but this is our last day. It's a half day here at GYC. It's been a blessing. A lot of the young people spent the new year going from 2018 to 2019 praying. And again, they got up at what, 4? 5.45, they started praying again this morning. Yeah, it's incredible to see the dedication of the young people. You may see a number of empty seats behind us. Don't worry, they will be filled. A lot of young people are coming from the uh, prayer room right now to our left, coming in and filling this auditorium as we get ready to hear again another powerful devotional brought to us by Pastor Getz. Absolutely. He's been bringing the devotionals every single morning. He's an anointed speaker, a speaker of the word. He's the pastor of the Campion Academy Church there in Campion, Colorado. Right. And we've been blessed by his messages every morning. And later this morning at 1045, we're going to hear from Pastor Taj Paklib as well with Revelation of Hope Ministries. So we have one more live presentation to bring to you here this morning. You know, sweetheart, I love GYC because there's a passion amongst the young people to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just want to encourage you at home to pray for the decisions that have been made here during this GYC and that you at home, as we begin a brand new year, would make a decision and a commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ to the end. Amen. Yeah, well said. And I liked what you said about the people at home because we have the young people that we can see and all the appeals and the altar calls as they go forward. But we know that you at home have also been making decisions for Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. And we want to hear from you too. So if you've made decisions for Christ or your experience, or if you've enjoyed watching GYC as 3 has brought that to you, please send us a little email, maybe drop a little line to us. It's always encouraging to hear from you. You can hear the music on the stage. Let's go to GYC as we're enjoying song service. Thank you again for joining us for 3ABN. Let me find my place so sweet. Yeah. next hymn we'll sing is hymn number 499, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We'll be singing the first and the third verses. First time in this new year, let's stand and sing our theme song, This Witness I Will Bear. Die. 
took him off to die, there his friendship I deny, forgive the sinner's eyes, he did not despise, to the end his love constrains me, to the end he has restored me, to the end I will still follow. Good morning and Happy New Year, GYC. How many of you have been blessed by the morning devotionals this week? Amen. I know that there is a rich blessing in store for us this morning. We would like to invite you to come after breakfast at 9.30 to General Assembly B meeting hall that's upstairs on the third floor, and we'll be having a panel with each executive committee member on it where you can ask different questions about the movement of GYC, its mission, and its focus. So again, that is at 9.30 in General Assembly B. This morning, our scripture reading is found in Acts chapter 5, verses 28 to 31. Acts 5, uh, verses 28 to 31, and I will be reading from the New King James Version. It reads, And the high priest asked them, the apostles, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on him. God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. As we begin our morning devotion, I just ask you to bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you so much for this new day of life and for this new year that you have given us. And as GYC comes to a close today, Father, we ask that a special measure of your Holy Spirit would be poured upon this place. And as Pastor Gett shares with us one last time, we pray that that you would be lifted up and that each heart would be drawn closer to you. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
I find at Jesus' knee. At Jesus' knee, there's shelter from this world. At Jesus' knee, I can feel His love. At Jesus' knee, though I may go astray, I'll always find my way to sit at Jesus' knee. Amen. Amen. Froyes, noyas, ya. Muakwa, unfia. Feliz año nuevo. Or feliz año nuevo. Or happy new year. I have this morning taken off my suit jacket, rolled up my sleeves, because we want to wrestle together. So get ready. Get ready. Oh God, prepare our hearts. It's our final day. We've got this morning, we've got a conversation mid-morning, and then we've got a final charge, and we're headed back. But God forbid it, would you? that we leave here the same as we came. So mobilize us and send us out. Radicals for the cause of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we learned the lesson of the seed this morning. Seeds are dispersed. That's how a plant spreads, sustains itself. There are four ways that seeds are dispersed. Anywhere in the world you go, there are four ways that seeds are dispersed. They are dispersed through water, wind, animals, or ballistic, they call it, mechanical. It's, it, within the seed is some sort of mechanism that causes it to launch. But every one of these happen the same way. The plant must be disturbed. The animal bumps against it, lands on it, or somehow interacts with the plant and picks up its seed. It disturbs the plant. Wind, water, the ballistic, the, the mechanical, the launch of the seed is oftentimes through some sort of contact, it gets bumped and then a seed springs. Learn the lesson of the seed. A dandelion. If you live in my neighborhood, you cringe every time one of those yellow flowers pops up and before you can even walk over and pick the yellow flower, it's already sprouted into one of those seed balls. They're so fast. And then you gingerly try to pick it without disturbing it so the seeds don't spread. But it is, it is impossible. It's futile. As soon as you snap that stem, just the slightest jerk, 
the seeds are out. Or what about the jack pine? Produces that resin filled cone that are solid, durable. Nothing can get into them until a fire occurs and its resin is melted and the cone pops open and the seeds fall out. They're disturbed, some sort of disturbance. And the seeds are released. Learn the lesson of the seed. Open your Bibles. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8. We're going to go to two chapters in Acts. But we're going to start in Acts chapter 8. And then we're going to back up just a few chapters to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 8. Starting in verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. This is Stephen's death. At the same, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men, this is now verse 2, carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Three verses. There are three operative words, key words, that if you just, if you take those three and list them off, you get the message of the entire three verses. And in a larger context of Acts, three words. Havoc, church, scattered. You can reduce those three verses and the larger message of Acts. Havoc, church, scattered. The church was disturbed. It was bothered. It was persecuted. Paul was only one of the examples, but Paul here wreaked havoc in the church. Havoc, church, scattered. The devil hates the church. It is the visible body of one who he hates with all that is within him. And as the community of faith comes together and reflects our head, Jesus Christ, he hates us. He's always hated us. Let me remind you, taking you back to Peter and Paul's day, Nero reigned for those 54 to about 68 AD, imprisoned and executed the Christians, including Paul and Peter. Domitian came next. He oppressed the Christians who refused to pay him divine honors. He exiled John. Marcus Aurelius believing that Christianity was dangerous and immoral, turned a blind eye to severe local outbreaks of mob violence. So he would say, you get them, you get them, we won't do do anything. You can just knock them out. Decius in the third century, he he took that persecution that was sporadic and turned it to systematic. It was just part of the calendar. Thousands died as he reigned. Diocletian, before the, Const- before the conversion of Constantine, issued four edicts which were intended to stamp out Christian- Christianity altogether. He ordered the church to be burned, scriptures to be confiscated, clergy to be tortured. Citizens, Christian citizens, were deprived of their citizenship. And we know from the narrative of Paul how important the citizenship could be. So they were deprived of their citizenship. And then it was free game. So it was that the early Christian apologist and author, Tertullian, spoke up addressing the rulers of the Roman Empire. 
addressing the, Ro the rulers of the Roman Empire, Tertullian cried out, kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we will grow. The seed is the blood of the Christians. Learn the lesson of the seed. Disturbed, it will spread. Havoc, church, scattered. The devil hates the church. He hated it then. He hates it now. But out of the gospel of Matthew comes the cogent statement of Jesus. Matthew 16 and verse 18. I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades itself will not prevail against it. Hell hates the church. But Jesus' promise is that the church will prevail. John Fox, we all know his work, Fox's Book of Martyrs. John Fox himself was persecuted for his Christianity. But he says, in, in which words three things are to be noted. Reflecting on Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he says there are three things that can be noted from, from Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. First, that Christ will have a church in this world. Secondly, that that same church shall be mightily impugned, not only by the world, but also by the uttermost strength of all hell. One, that Christ will have a church, but secondly, it will be persecuted. It will be hated. It will be attacked. The devil himself will wreak havoc. Thirdly, that that same church, notwithstanding the uttermost attacks of evil, with all of the devil's malice, shall continue. John Fox, who personally knew it in his life, the the hot, stinky breath of the devil. He said, listen, Christ will have a church. He will have a community. He will have those who are radical in their, in their discipleship, following him. But the devil will hate them with all the power of hell. But thirdly, that that church, though hated by hell, will continue. And we would say at GYC, Havoc, church, scattered. Those three operative words unpack for us the reality of the early church and the prophetic movement of the final church. Oh, Saul turned Paul. It's long gone on this scene, yet there still remains this hatred from hell. The devil will still continue to wreak havoc in the church. Beloved, he's not done. In the face of persecution, however, the church did not become political. They did not attempt to deal with the political grievances of their day. They didn't organize themselves for a protest against Rome. They organized themselves for prayer and for mission. That was their protest, the final protest. They didn't seek to change the, the laws. They knew that the government was corrupt. They knew that the devil hated them and that he would wreak havoc in the church. If they spent their time trying to fix that, they would miss out on the opportunity. So they focused themselves on what was most important on their trump card, as it were. It's the lesson we can learn from that transatlantic flight early in aviation history. Pilot Solo crossing the, trans, the, the Atlantic. Early on, it was a marvel. He's about halfway across when he realizes that there's been a gnawing sound, a, 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 a bit of a ruckus somewhere up in his cabin. 
And he finally locates the problem coming out of New York on his takeoff. Somehow a rat had gotten on his plane. He's halfway out and he looks up to find this rat nine on a cable that was vital to his ability to land. He's stuck. He has nowhere to go. There's a rat. And he knows if he makes moves to try to, to, to capture the rat, the rat will just go into hiding and possibly cause even more problems. So he thinks it through. And he begins to pull the plane up higher and higher. Higher and still higher. Until he finds himself at an elevation where slowly the gnawing stops. Later he lands the plane and throws out the dead rat. The church didn't become political. It did not become focused on the grievances, on the havoc. It didn't seek to change the problem. Havoc, church, scattered. The church took the high road, pulled up the controls, and went to an elevation where the havoc couldn't breathe. That's Tertullian. Hey, you can grind us to dust, but the more you do it, the more we will grow. We'll take the high road. Oh, church, that we would learn this. We can absorb ourselves with trying to fix what ails us. The havoc that the devil causes from without and from within. We can consume ourselves with committees and commissions. Havoc, church, scattered. They went. They, from the havoc, took strength and went out to the world to proclaim Jesus. Acts chapter 5. To find it again. What was it? What was their trump card? What was the one thing that they knew that they knew that they knew? <laughs> the, these guys got called in all the time. They get called in. Hey, you got to stop preaching. Paul, Peter, John, they all. You got to stop preaching. What was their response? If we can't, we just can't. We can we simply cannot that is what we exist for. Well, if you don't stop preaching, we'll, we'll beat you up. Drove their enemies crazy. <laughs> we'll beat you up. If you don't stop preaching about Jesus, we'll beat you up. What was their response? To be beaten for Jesus would be a promotion. It messed their enemies up. They'd get together. <sighs> we can't give these guys any promotions. What are we going to do? So they let them go. Bring them back in. Hey, you stop preaching about Jesus. We're not going to just beat you up. We'll kill you. We'll kill you. <laughs> what would they say? It would be an honor to die for my Lord. Ugh. We can't give them any honors. What do we do? <laughs> it's Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 18. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and tapped them on the shoulders and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. <laughs> the angels don't even miss a beat. Hey, 
Don't I get some downtime, a night of rest, maybe a, no, 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 go, 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 preach, go stand in the temple and speak to the people. Well, you know what happened. Here comes, here comes the high priest in his little parade. He took him back in. Didn't we not strictly command you to, to not teach in his name? Verse 28, same chapter. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with, this, with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us, which is, of course, ironic because of their cry with Pilate. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men, the God of our fathers. And here's, their, here's what they have that you can't take from them. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him, God has exalted to the right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You can threaten us, but guess what? The resurrection? You can kill us. But guess what? There's a resurrection. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. You can't dissuade us or distract us or discombobulate us. You can't do it. It's like in the game of Uno. You play Uno, right? You play Uno and you get down to Uno. As soon as you say Uno, everybody is looking cross-eyed at you. What does he got? What does he got? Is it, is it, does he still got that green? Does he still got the green? Or is it the red? What is, what is he, what has he got? What has he got? And so they play, and the person before you, woo, they, they, they're okay because they've got one of those wilds that changes the color. Not the draw for, but just a wild that changes the color. So they know that if, if they can just figure out what you have, then they can take your game off. All right? Uh, he's got the green. He's got the green. I, th- I think he's got the green. Change it to red. Red. All the while, you yourself hold the wild card. Change the color on me. Yellow, blue, green, or red, I'll play. You can't beat it. That's the wild card. Our Jesus has been resurrected and now exalted. What you gonna do? What are you gonna do? You can kill me. Oh, beloved, the church didn't stop to to declare how unfair the world was, how unfair politics were in or out of the church. The church, while havoc was being descending on the church, the church went out. If we stop to fix to get everything right with our culture and with what, what, with what we perceive as right in the church, we will miss out on what we've been called to do. We have the resurrection. You can't beat us. So we're going to take it. Even the angel that pulled them out of the prison said, we've got no time, no time to draw up documents or to protest against the unfairness of the, of the civil authorities. Go. Go share Jesus. Just go. You're waiting for a time when the world is fair? Pa, Havoc will always be here. The devil has not given up. But it's difficult sometimes. It's difficult. Injustice, pain or hurt has caused you. And beloved, let's be honest, it's sometimes we do it to each other. We do it to each other. It's not even the, it's not even the Romans that do it to us. Sometimes it's, it's we do it to ourselves. We hurt each other. We find that gnat raw, or that rat gnawing on our cable, and we have to make the decision. If I focus on the rat, I'll, I'll lose. So I'm going to pull this plane up higher, and the rat won't survive. It's not just in a corporate sense, it's also in a personal sense. 
personal pain distracts us. Our friend, Pastor Conway, has told us to go to the end, we've got to go to the end of ourselves. What if we, what if we use pain as, it, as what it is? It's a mobilizer. Pain is a mobilizer. It will mobilize us to something. We can be mobilized to focus on it or we can be mobilized to go to the end. And don't tell me that pain is not a mobilizer. I live with a dental hygienist and she tells me there are people that are hard to get into the chair until one morning they wake up with just a, ooh, they are crying for an appointment in the dentist chair. You know how it is. Nah, I can put it off. Who do these dentists think they are? They just want my money. They just want me to come. They don't, they don't ah, ooh, can I have an appointment today? Let me, just, let me just tell you, the two darkest periods of my life, black as night, dark periods, wrestling with God, feeling like Jacob beside the brook. Come on, God. One of them, while I was in high school, was in a head-on collision between a bus and a semi-truck headed into surgery, a rod in one leg and a plate in the other, I was told amputation was a possibility and certainly I would never walk again. Dark time. A second, just an emotional, spiritual time in college, just wrecked. But out of those two dark periods came the most beautiful things of my life. My commitment to Jesus, and my wife. One night, standing on my porch in Bering Springs, Michigan, crying out to God, middle of the night, one or two in the morning, it's dark. I'm looking out into the darkness, and I'm telling God, this is exactly how I feel. It's dark, God. You're not giving me any light, any hope. And then he asked me a question. He said, Michael, is the road still there even though you can't see it? Are those houses still out there even though you can't see them? Yeah, yeah, they're still there. Of course they're there. And he said, just because it is dark as night in your heart and mind doesn't mean there's not a reality there I have for you. I took a picture of it. I actually, no flash, I just took a picture of the darkness. I've saved that picture. Sometimes it's inside of us hurt. Sometimes it's 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 because of the church and the havoc that the the devil it's it's we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, beloved. It's not a president, president, a pastor, or a segment of our of our church. Let's just be real. It's not those who are more conservative or more progressive than you that are causing the problems in the church. The devil hates the church and he is wreaking havoc. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. And in your own life, it's not your, your, your spouse or your children or your parents or a friend or another individual that is wreaking havoc. The devil hates you. But we've got an ace. We've got the answer. We've got the ultimate. We've got the wild card. Our Jesus has been resurrected and is now exalted as our representative to the throne of heaven. We have the answer. So instead of trying to fix the havoc, because the havoc will not be fixed, let's go to the world. Let's go to the end. I've got a story here. Jessica Buchanan wrote a book, Impossible Odds, about her story. If you have not heard or read her story, it's well worth the read. But let me take you to an interview she did. To summarize it, she, Buchanan was a humanitarian aid worker with a Danish 
organization. She had come to help children learn how to not step on, on landmines in Somalia. It's a dangerous place on this planet. But she went. She went to the end. She was there to help children learn how to not, not step on landmines. But in a flash of violence, her car was stopped by a mob and she was kidnapped. Her and her partner kidnapped and the kidnappers demanded $45 million for their release. So CBS, she sat down with the news anchor, Scott Pelley. What did they do? Where did they keep you day in and day out, he asked. Under trees, she said, and outside. How long? How long were you outside? How long were you outside before you had a day in? How long were you outside? 93 days, three months. She didn't go inside a building. She was forced to live out underneath a tree, sleep in the open. What were nights like? Long and cold, the rainy season hit, and it would rain all night, and we were freezing, sitting there, wet, out in the open. What were you eating? She said, once a day, maybe. They would give us a little tuna fish and a piece of bread. She said, after about three months, she began to lose hope. Her heart began to just collapse within her. No, no, no. Let me tell you the truth. After one month, she began to lose hope. But for the next two months, she would have to grind it out day after day after day. $45 million? Who's, who's that? She's just an aid worker working for a Danish organization. American, yes, but... So Scott Pelley asked her, as the weeks and months went by, did you think that the American government is watching you? Did, you? did you think that they knew who you were? Did you think anybody cared? No, no, she said, no. I didn't think anybody knew who I was. Why? Because I was just an aid worker, she said. I, I, I was just there on a, a little bit of my own mission. And then Scott Pelley asked her, did, you, did it ever cross your mind that the President of the United States would actually know your name? Never, never in a million years, she said. But after three months in the desert, Buchanan had a serious urinary tract infection. And in a final call to the hostage no negotiator, she said, I've become so ill I can't stand up. I can't walk. I am in so much pain. And then she said, I think I have a kidney infection. And she started to cry. I think, I think, I'm afraid I'm going to die. That set in motion. As the word got back, hey, she's got a kidney infection. This is serious. That set in motion some events. One moonless night, she's crying out her story into the starry night now, looking up and saying, God, God, please help me. Please help me. She was trying to sleep on her thin mat. She, she was restless. She was in pain. She was cold. She was hungry. She couldn't sleep. She heard a faint scratching sound, and so did her captors. They sat up. The next moment, there was a burst of gunfire and then silence. Let me read it in her own words to you. All of a sudden, I feel hands on me, roughly grabbing me, and I try to protect myself. I pull the little blanket closer to the top of me, and then I hear my name, but it's not in an accent, at least not a Somali accent. It's an American accent, and I can't compute. Like, I, do, I can't understand that somebody with an American accent knows my name. And they say, Jessica, we're with the American military. We're here to take you home. You're safe. 
I pull the blanket down from my face and all I see is black Americans? I don't understand. You're American? How, how did you get here? They ask me where my shoes are. I say, I don't know. I don't know where my shoes are. So one of them picks me up and starts running across the desert. He runs for several minutes and puts me down on the ground. I'm still asking, who are you? I don't understand who they are and I don't understand what they've done. Then they identify themselves. Jessica, we're Navy SEALs. We're here to take you home. They have some medicine and some water and some food. At one point, they think they hear something, and so they lie down. I don't know this group of men, but they all lie on top of me, risking their lives for me. We lay like that until suddenly helicopters arrive and land. Scott Pelley, the news anchor, asked her, when all those seals lay down on top of you, what did you feel? She said, I began to feel like I was the most important thing in the world to them. It was so hard to comprehend. They were so kind and gentle. They were trying to assist me. After the helicopters landed, they tried to assist me. But I'm thinking to myself, I've been here for three months. I can run myself. And she breaks away and takes off running to the helicopter through the scrub and through the bush. I throw myself onto the helicopter and push myself up against the wall. And then I take a breath. Navy SEALs arrive at the door, hand me an American flag that's folded, and then disappear again into the night to take their own exit plan. The helicopter lifts off, and I'm headed home. Did you catch that line? Scott Pelley asked her, did you think in a million years, did you think that the President of the United States knew your name? No, not in a million years, she said. But in fact, the President of the United States did know her name and ordered her rescue. And it is this morning that the President of this United States doesn't know my, I don't know that any President of any country knows my name or yours. But the King of the Universe does. The King of the Universe does. He knows your name. He knows your name. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're hurting, what you're struggling with. The darkness of the night in your life, or maybe it's some hurt in the church. The devil will always wreak havoc. He will continue to wreak havoc until he is finally chained into the millennium. He will wreak havoc. The three operative words, havoc, church, scattered to the end. So let's go. Let's go young and old. Let's go beloved. Let's go GYC. The God of the universe knows our name. The commander in chief. We are precious to him. And he will make sure he unleashes all units. Listen, Navy SEALs, pa! One angel took out a hundred Roman soldiers guarded to the teeth, armed to the teeth rather, guarding the tomb of Jesus. A hundred Roman soldiers couldn't stand to one. And he'll empty heaven for you. So let's go. But it occurs to me and to us that the havoc that Satan has wreaked in our hearts, in our minds, or in our church has been preventing us, distracting us, discombobulating us from what we've been called to do, to scatter, to go to the end. Let's just be transparent with each other. Some of us here are bothered by the journey that our community of faith, our denomination is in right now. We hear of one side or hear of another. We hear of one meeting or see a video. There's an article posted or something said and we've become discouraged or discombobulated. Unless you are different than the congregation I serve in, 
that's the truth today. But maybe it's not the church that bothers you. You've been able to just, just put that off. Maybe it's something personal in your life, a, a, a hurt, a damaged relationship, a pain, a loss. Maybe you've just become distracted, an addiction. But in your heart of heart, you want to go to the end. In your heart of hearts, you want to be scattered. You want to go. You want to be in it all for Jesus. So this morning for the appeal, I'm going to invite pastors and prayer coordinators, and they're going to stretch themselves out across this front. Pastors and prayer coordinators that struggle and journey just like you, but that have taken hold of the hope that burns within our hearts. And they're gonna stretch out. They're gonna stretch out across this front. And here's the appeal. Let's let Jesus heal us today. And so if you've been distracted or discouraged or pained by the church, I'm sorry, we're sorry. If havoc has been wreaked in your life, through broken relationships or loss and you need healing. You know that you need healing and so that you can be mobilized this afternoon. You're on a plane, on a bus, in a car. You need to go. You, we will scatter across this world this afternoon. But before we scatter, we must be healed and we're, we're, we need to ask Jesus. We need to ask Jesus, Jesus, heal us. So my appeal to you is that you would, if, if you fit if one of you here today, and we've got about 20 of us up here, we don't, if, if we only need one of them, that's fine. But our, our guess is that there's a few of us here today that need Jesus to touch our lives, to heal us from the distraction in the church or out of the church, in our personal lives or in the corporate, whatever it's been, the devil will continue to wreak it, but we're gonna go scatter. And so if you want Jesus to ask Jesus this morning, would you heal me? Would you heal me? I would invite you to come up here and you just stand. We're going to go two or three to each one of these pastors or prayer leaders. If, if, if there's a prayer leader or a pastor that's open, you go to them. Whatever the, the, the least number is, if, if there's four or five and you see one with only two, go to them. Just And, and pastors and prayer leaders, you're probably going to need to scat, stretch out, stretch out, stretch out, prayer leaders. You probably need to go left and right just a little bit more but you want Jesus to take your life and let it be. And Naomi is going to sing for us now this invitation, take my life and let it be. We're, going to, we're not going to, prayer leaders and pastors, we're not going to pray until this is all over, so you just wait. But in the meantime, take your groups and stretch them out, stretch them out. Pastors, prayer leaders, hear me, stretch out.
to me. If there is one more that needs to come up and say, Jesus, I've been hurt. The devil has wreaked havoc in my life. Come. In just a few hours, we will scatter across this globe. Would you come? ask Jesus to just heal you. We can't do it. There's nothing that we can say. The church we are a part of, we hurt each other sometimes. Nobody intends to. The devil, though, will take an opportunity and twist it and change it and hurt us. And then, of course, the world is cold and dark and it will, it will do its own damage. But if we're going to scatter, we need to just come to Jesus. He's the answer. He's the resurrected Christ, the one who now is beside the throne. So one more. Don't, don't leave. Don't leave GYC without the moment of coming to Jesus and asking him to heal you so we can go and be scattered. He knows your name. He knows your hurt. Just like Jessica Buchanan, the commander-in-chief knows who you are. And he's got a team of Navy SEAL angels. Even in the darkness of your own night, you can't see it. You don't know where they're at. They're coming. So would you come and ask Jesus, please heal me. Please heal my heart. And use this pain personal or corporate, private or public, use this pain to mobilize me, to scatter me. Jesus, I'm in it to the very end. In just a moment, your prayer leader or pastor is going to just pray with your circle. Thank you for coming up. But let's listen to this final invitation through the song. Those days I will pour out my spirit. So let it be, O oh God, through the havoc that the devil is wreaking in our personal and in our church, that we are mobilized to the end and your spirit is poured out. The men servants, your maid servants. Amen. Amen.